Hey, welcome to today's class, Wednesday, June 26. We're almost done uh, with the class and really wish we could do this in person. I think we'd get more accomplished in person, but glad you guys have been involved in this and I hope you like some of the you know, looks behind the scenes we've given of play-by-play -play people, including our own Jeff Haxton and Jamie Lent. Of course, um, to me, the greatest play-by-play -play person of all time is Vin Scully, but that's going to be a test question, so remember that. Uh, but it's not the right answer. The right answer is whoever you think is the best, and that's how you develop your style. And some people might not like Vince Scully. can't imagine that, but some people might not. I hate the Dodgers, but I still love Vince Scully as an announcer. So get your assignment three done today. Assignment four will come on quickly. And the next week, your final project worth 100 points, I'm just going to ask you to call – I'll play by play, and I'm going to give you a couple of uh, clips in with the team information from both teams. Um, you're going to have to prepare and get ready. It's worth 100 points, but I'm going to grade very reasonably because you're not going to have a color commentator unless you pull one in to help you with it. And um, then we're going to have a test next week, and then we're going to be done. It's 4th of July, and you guys are going to make good choices and all be safe on the 4th of July and come back to uh, uh, your friends and family and, and uh, everyone else. So make good choices. One of the things uh, that I want to talk about, I'm going to show you this slide and then we're going to get into today's lecture. So I had an incident uh, today with a guy on Twitter. He had tweeted, uh, he had direct messaged me on Twitter asking me if he could use our facility on a certain day. I told him it should be okay, but I'm going to check with compliance and compliance is kind of our good cop, bad cop, and uh, he went ahead and tweeted about it before I gave him permission, and I, I got upset with him, and we had a, we had some words on the phone, and I probably um, uh, was probably too mad, um, and we got it worked out. It's all worked out, but it goes to what I told you guys about the other day, trust. Trust is the most important thing, not only in this business, but any business uh, that you want to get into, and what you do, and how you do it, and who you do it with, and the way you do it. And we're going to make sure that we always trust, build our reputation so people trust us because that's, uh, you're not going to get anywhere if people don't trust you, especially in the news or broadcast business. So keep that in mind for today. I want to talk about getting, remember, to getting ready for a broadcast um, and some keys to that. And then we're going to, uh, I'm going to do a favor here to Sydney Goodson because she mentioned a, um, one of her favorite calls of all time, and I've got two different shots of that that we want to talk about. Then we're going to talk about the difference between radio and television, and this lecture today is chock full of test questions. But again, things that we want to remember, we're going to see here in a minute uh, different charts, but chart in your style, what works best for you. And again, a chart is going to have all your information that you're going to use when you call a game. Uh, players, information like that. But the things you want to make sure is you have a complete roster, numbers are right, and the correct pronunciations of a name. I can't tell you the number of times in a radio broadcast when a kid's parent from another team would come up to me at the booth and say, hey, you're saying my kid's name wrong. They'd have the headphones on listening to us in the, in the place. And I wanted to hear that, right? Because Giovanetti is the way you say my name. I want people to say it correctly. So pronunciations are correct. When you're, uh, you want to make sure they're correct. And it's never good. You always want to know who every player is. So you don't want to say, hey, number 23 with the ball. Uh, Johnson passes to number 23. Back over to Simpson. You don't want that. You want to know the names. Uh, also on your chart, just general team information and then stats and other relevant information. There are all kinds of different spotting boards. I wanted to show you some here on a really great website, again, for what we're doing. Um, hopefully I can go back to, uh, yeah, I can go back to our site. But here, let's just look at a, we've talked a lot about baseball in this class, but um, there's water polo, um, soccer, lacrosse, obviously. We've got football players, we've got basketball players in this class. So let's, let's look at, let's look at basketball. Person. This is just one example of a spotting board, and uh, this is the way um, that I liked to do it too. So you see highlighted 
um, the last names. Lewis, Chambers, McCarthy. It's Somoan. I don't know that. I would put a. I would put the pronunciation uh, by that if this was mine. Aiken, and there would be others. Um, you see here on the left side, uh, this was the number ten recruiting class in the nation uh, last year by ESPN. Um, just little things like this person liked uh, 1534's total height of team, um, and it's showing that Christ the Redeemer's the team they're playing is is uh, smaller. Um, but they're right. So let's look at uh, Chris Lewis here from Alpharetta, Georgia. Uh, Chris is averaging. Um, if you look at this, well, now I can't see there. Chris is shooting 71% from the free throw line. There you go. Averaging 8.7 points a game, 4.5 rebounds. You can see these all right here. Assists, uh, probably not averaging 11, but probably 11 assists on the year. 21 blocks on the year. Steals, uh, uh, nine. So it's tall. Chris is tall. Um, a freshman, 6'9". And um, you see he's got highlighted the blocks 21 that's what this announcer felt was important has started all but stanford fordham nu bc games some stats there about it just quick looking so when number zero comes in the game you look and really quickly say lewis enters the game then you have all these other uh nuggets about chris lewis so um this is just one way to do a spotting board this is on our site uh on our um uh, on Blackboard, so you can go back and look at it. Here's an example of a uh, football spotting board by a guy named Matt Jones. This one would not be in large enough type for me. And this is AM Commerce, who's actually pretty good um, at playing Delta State. And again, you can see this is even hard to read. Uh, the numbers are smaller. Um, you can look here. This person has both first and last name. Most people really highlight the last name that can see it. So um, there you look at twenty-seven is Trap Porter, twenty-four is Chris Smith. Wasn't the other person's name Chris Smith too? Look, that's interesting. Um, again, so here's all that. Then on the information on the left side, uh, they have the information for commerce, and this is obviously the first game of the year. You can see number eight in the AFCA rankings, um, third division two school, and Carthel, Kobe Carthel, uh, who went to Angelo State, uh, and I just know the Carthel name has been around a uh, has been around a while, so that's one way to do that spotting board. I don't really like that one now that I see it. So, um, but again, everybody's is different of how they want to do something, and I don't find that one to be particularly helpful. So let's see what the uh, Andy Towns is here. Yeah, and Andy's got a little bit better one. This is um, the offense. You can see the names there on the offensive side of the board. Um, this is obviously their line. 71 is Paris. Garrick, Lissy, Johnson. Again, I would have all their pronunciations. I don't know how he pronounces these names. And clearly he's got here the starters in red and then the backups and white. So here you see wide receiver X, Coxon, uh, who's averaging, who's got t three touchdowns on the year. Uh, Bednarski at quarterback, 55 of 107 for the year. Four, four picks, four touchdowns, longest play of 83 yards. Um, so you see all that there. You see right there. So let's look at Bednarski. Connor Bednarski on the year, 51% uh, thrower, four touchdowns for 678 yards. He averages 84.8 yards per game. Well, that's one quarter here at Texas Tech, and the longest 83. And then you see the coaches listed over here. Uh, so this one's a lot better. This one I think is easier to read. The key again is there is no perfect way uh, to run a railroad or to do something like this. So you develop a spotting board that's easy for you. As you do your assignment, you probably won't do a spotting board. You could, and if you do, I want you to include it for me. Um, but for the most part, I probably wouldn't do that. So all that is great, and you also, but it all goes into calling the game. So Sydney had talked about this call right here of being one of her all-time favorites, and he actually had called a very similar game uh, previously to that when um, Notre Dame beat UConn in the semifinals. So let's watch the, a little bit of this, and then I've got another great video uh, to show with it.
and again preparation is great everything else is great but then you've got to you've got to call the game as well That's key. First three pointer of Notre Dame tonight. He had that stat ready to go. You know, this is a TV guy. He's letting the action. He didn't call every little thing. He's letting the game kind of come to him. Great information. No team has ever won the title by coming down from double digits twice. Pay attention here at the end. When he calls this game-winning shot, and how he knows, the picture and the audio itself tells the story. Notice how quiet he was. Notice that he didn't feel like he had to run over it or anything else. He let the motion and everything else call. It was a great call. And if you read my uh, top there, it's a great call, and he knows it. So ESPN did a really cool thing. Um, oh, man, it's not letting me, it's not letting me see this. Darn it. Um, I'll send you the link. There's a great, call, there's a great um, link where he... Uh, there's a great video of him calling it and his reaction and how fun it was. And that's one of the great things about this job is that where else are you going to get that kind of excitement? Uh, and you're not, you're not going to find it anywhere. I'm going to find that. Uh, I'm going to find that video here in a minute, but uh, it, it's, uh, it's fantastic. So uh, some of the things that other things that you need to know going in, know the rules. If you don't know the rules, get a rule book. Always should have one, even if you do know the rules. Every year in baseball, I would get a new rule book. Uh, when I started calling volleyball for the first time, I got a rule book. Seek out new rule changes. That, you know, the three-point line is different. Uh, uh, basketball has got rules in the lane that change every year. So you always want to change those. always want to check on those things. Uh, I always tried to talk to game officials before a game, uh, especially – in basketball to say, hey, what are you guys going to be looking for? What are some things you look for? In baseball, they have a uh, they have a, a game clock, a time clock for the pitcher. Sometimes umpires kind of let that go. So I would ask the umpires if I saw them, hey, are you guys going to pay attention to that? Um, it's always good to have a rule book in the booth with you. Uh, bookmark certain rules that you know. I would always bookmark Bach rules because Bach is kind of an interesting thing in baseball. Uh, and then if you don't know the rule, don't be guessing on the air. Ask somebody. That's going to be a great test question. So if you're listening to this, would it be better to say, hey, I think they called this rather than, you know what? We don't know the exact rule here. Let's, we'll ask somebody and find out. The answer is ask somebody. 
it's better to ask. It's better to say, hey, I don't know exactly what's happening here. So let me find out. You should know the rules, but sometimes you don't know everything uh, that's happening. But you heard Adam Amin, a really great uh, announcer. We talked about Vince Scully, talked about others. Uh, you got to develop your own style. And how does that happen? Practice, practice, practice. If you watch the Doc, Doc Emmerich video uh, from Real Sports with Brian Gumbel, he talked about driving to Fort Wayne, Indiana, sitting in the stands, recording himself, calling the action. Um, do that. Practice. Start doing that in games. Now when I sit at a baseball game, even if I'm not calling it, I'm calling it in my head because I'm so used to calling games. You need to start that. It's like going to the driving range if you're a golfer, right? You've got to practice. It's like practicing your free throw shooting. It's like practicing whatever you're doing. You've got to do that. And then think of yourself as a river, and you're taking in all of these different styles. Who do you like? What styles do you like? What styles can you incorporate into the way you do things? You have to be you, but also it's great to incorporate others. And you hear things that people do, and you use those. A lot of people think, hey, I don't have a voice for this. There's no such thing as a radio or television voice. And the worst thing you can do is start saying, okay, it's time to call today's game. I'm Robert Giovanetti, and we're here. No, that's awful. You heard that from Jamie and Haxton, right? Haxton is um, got a kind of a classic radio voice, deep voice, good timber to it. Jamie's got a really high-pitched kind of squeaky voice, but they both make it work. And again, there's no one specific way to want to do things. Um, following the ebb and flow of a game, um, you heard him when you hit the, you heard Adam on that three-pointer. If that gives Notre Dame a 10 to seven lead in the first quarter, he's not going to go, eh, it's the three he's going to be different. So you need to know where you are in the game. You call the first inning of a baseball game, maybe a little bit differently than you call the ninth inning of a baseball game. If it's a tense game, you need to have that in your voice, right? This is, we're getting down to the end, two minutes left, a minute left, we're tied, going back and forth, rather than, oh, text up by 43 as we enter the final two minutes of the game. It's different. And so your voice needs to follow the ebb and flow of the game. And remember, again, Adam is a great example there. He projected, rather than just being loud, it's not screaming, he just projected his voice louder. He was excited. And sometimes that changes your cadence as well. You don't want to say, Sidney Goodson with the three for the win. You've got to change your cadence up. And so that's what you want to do uh, as you go through that. Your voice is very important. It's not the only thing. All the other things we talked about are important as well. Preparing, trust, developing a style, all those things. But your voice is also very important. A couple of distinctions we want to make. If we had just seen that Notre Dame call on the radio, it would have been much different. On the radio, the play-by-play -play person is much more important. It's the lead. They have to use critical detail, vivid descriptors. The ball's on the left side, move to the right side, uh, near side, far side, different things like that. Texas Tech in the white uniforms with the red piping and the red lettering and the black hats, the black helmets, the red jerseys with the white numbers, whatever. You're being very vivid. Television, you can see that. It drives me crazy when I'm watching a television broadcast and the announcer saying, Baylor with green uniforms and yellow numbers. Yes, we can see that. We can see that. You don't have to give us those vivid described descriptions, which you would on the radio. Who's initiating the action? You're not, they're not seeing anything, so you need to make sure. One time I was calling a baseball game, and there was another game going to be played afterwards, and you could hear the guys in the batting cage and the ball going, ping! Ping, ping, and I wasn't thinking about that, but somebody told me afterwards, they're listening on the radio, and they could hear that, and it was confusing them because they thought that was actually happening in our game. Um, you've got to like really make brief descriptions of key plays because you've got to move on to the next play. And again, remember, your voice is everything. Somebody turns the radio on, and you it's a tech radio broadcast and tech is losing 14 to nothing in a baseball game, you're probably not going to be as peppy and as excited as if, hey, tech is leading or it's a, you're about to win a conference title or whatever. 
your voice sometimes can tell the story also. Sad, disappointed, excited, happy, whatever. Your voice is radio. It does make more of a difference than on television. Key thing, one of the most important things on calling a game on the radio, give the score. Give it the score. Give us the score again. Never too many times. If you think it's enough, it's not enough. Give the score over and over again. There was a great broadcaster named Red Barber who had an egg timer, and he would literally start it, and when it would go off, he would give the score again. Um, some people use uh, hourglass, little however many minutes are in that. Turn it over, sand runs out, give the score. Whatever it would be, just remember, and if you're thinking, hey, I haven't given the score in a while, give the score. You can never give it enough. Different sports, there's different things that goes with it. Football, not only do you give the score, but you also need to give the time of the game down and distance. Second and 10. Here in the three minutes left in the first quarter. Texas Tech leading seven to nothing. Basketball and hockey, it's time and score. Tied at 20 with one minute left here in the first half. Tech leading by seven as we near the end of the third quarter. Two minutes left in the third quarter. Whatever that would be. And in baseball, the count, three balls, two strikes, two runners on, one on first, one on third. Here in the bottom of the fourth inning, Texas Tech leading it three to two. Again, that's very important on uh, baseball, giving the count. It's two balls, no strikes, one ball, no strikes, three balls, full count, two runners on, bases loaded, nobody on. What inning and the score? All those things are very important, and every one of these things is a test question. Calling it on television, a little different. On television, generally, the color commentator is more prominent because they have more of a role. The play-by-play -play person talks less. The play-by-play -play person can be a little more concise. The play-by-play -play person can really spend more time talking about different things happening, talking about personal stories, because we can see the action. So the television announcer is more of just kind of guiding it along talks a little bit less is a little more concise lets the color commentator really take the role break down a play why did this happen you'll hear this all the time a lot of you know this right because of who you're talking about who some of your favorite commentators are and a lot of times it's the color person tony romo troy aikman those guys are are people that um really know the game know why uh, tony romo is about as good of a, a color commentator as I've ever heard at a very, very uh, um, young point in his career. But um, he, because he understands the game, he's got a feel for the game and uh, knows what's happening. Radio, again, is kind of more nuts and bolts. Um, television, you can be a little more free range. You can tell a few more stories and um, tell some other things that, that are important to you. So, um, it's just a little bit different on how uh, those two things operate. And again, but television is always remember, we can see it. We can see uh, what you're talking about. So don't be afraid uh, to, don't be afraid to let the action speak for itself. I'm trying to find that reaction. Hopefully I can show it to you here because um, it's pretty cool to watch it. And it shows you again, I think it gives a great example of why being a play-by-play -play person is a uh, is a cool thing. I'm, um, I'm not sure I'm gonna get this. Bear with me. Bear with me. It's gonna be all worth it when you see this. Um, I'm gonna be so disappointed if this doesn't work. Oh. Uh, it says I don't. It's on Vimeo, and so it says um, um, I don't have access. Where I had it, I had it earlier. Let me look real quick. Are you still with me? Getting close.
it's crazy how that there's the game previously they had a very similar game against um, UConn in the in the semis where um, he had a very similar reaction uh, but it wasn't nearly as great and again obviously one's a national championship and the one's uh, was not well I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to find it I'll find it and show it to us in the next class but anyway I appreciate uh, uh, all you guys get your assignment free and remember this, remember some key takeaways. We want to remember some of the things that Haxton and Lent talked to us about, the differences in their roles. Those would be test questions. Uh, the difference between the play-by-play -play guy and the color guy. Uh, the difference between, and I use the term guy, again, we need more women in this, and um, I, I think the more, more women that want to do this, it's great. But remember some of these key elements that we talked about. Remember some of the things. Count, inning, score, runners on base for baseball. Down and distance, quarter, time, score for football. And remember the score is very important, especially on radio. Television is not necessarily as important because you normally have a little score bug in the corner. We'll show that uh, in the next day or two. We're almost done. Get your assignment done, and we'll move on. Thank you.